ESHG Honorary Award. And um, this goes to Helena Karajainen. And Helena has, uh, yes. As you can see here, Helena has been active in genetics for many, many years. I'm not going to read all this, but uh, even more important, she has done a fantastic job for our so so society. Being a board member since 2001, general se secretary, president, and the last thing she did was to be our president at the International so Society for Human Genetics. So, so she has worked for our society for 16 years. That's a lot. And her work has been uh, very skillful, efficient, always with the right focus and with wisdom and fairness. So in short, I would say she has been the mother of next generation ESHG. So please come to the stage. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. The ESHG Award is annually given to a European scientist who has made a significant contribution to our field. It gives me a great pleasure to announce that Matt Hurls, head of the Human Genetics Department at the Wellcome Trust Sanger Institute, is this year's winner of the ESHG Award. Matt studied biochemistry in Oxford and did his PhD in Leicester. In 2003, he moved to the Sanger Institute where he is working until today. He has done an enormous amount of research in Y-chromosome evolution and a lot of work on studying structure variation in our genome, really understanding the mechanisms and the impact of copinoma variation in health and disease. And he's been very much involved with the Thousand Genomes Project. His most important contribution, as recognized by the Scientific Program Committee, is through his leadership of the Deciphering Developmental Disorders Consortium in the UK. Working together with numerous colleagues, and I see a very important colleagues sitting just behind Matt, he has been able to unite the clinical genetic services in the UK and to collect samples from tens of thousands of patients with developmental disorders, study their genetics, learn about the genes involved, and provide important diagnosis. His research has really shown how research and diagnostics in our field go hand in hand. He is a great organizer. I think that is really important in this field. And he, of course, recognizes very much the importance of collaboration. He has set standards and used them for phenotyping to link to genotyping and he's been very much involved in data sharing, which is essential in our field as well. 
Now, this is all very important, um, but actually, um, you know, we also know Matt as a fanatic cyclist, a cricket player, and from the ECG interview, we also know he loves gardening. When I googled a little bit further, I found that he likes to make sculptures of deer out of copper piping. And his favorite gene is NR2F2, and he may explain us perhaps at this lecture why. He's received numerous awards, and he's recently appointed fellow of the UK Academy of Medical Sciences, and we're very proud that he's this, this year's ECG award winner, Matt Hurls. If you, can you read out the, the text? Oh, that's actually, ah. ah. So Joris has asked me to read out the text. It says, uh, the ESHG wishes to recognize Dr. Matthew Hurls for his pioneering work in developing and applying novel genomics approaches to unravel the genetics of developmental disorders, as well as his basic research to understand the genomic mechanisms of disease. This has provided both fundamental biological insights, as well as improved the diagnosis of patients with rare genetic disorders. So it's a really fantastic honor, and, and thank you to the members of the, uh, of the program committee for, for awarding me this, and it's fantastic that I get an opportunity to talk to so many friends and colleagues and collaborators um, about uh, the things that interest me most, which is, uh, which is new mutations. Um, and, uh, and I'd like to start with, because uh, I wasn't quite sure how much Joris would say, and I'm sure my wife would disagree with me being very well organized, but. Um, but, uh, but I, I have a mini CV uh, on, on this first page, which is, uh, which is, so when I started my PhD, which uh, to millennials out there will seem like the dark ages of 1996, uh, it was very much focused on, on human prehistory and anthropological genetics. Uh, and then, uh, as Joris mentioned, in 2003, I, I changed focus and, and, uh, and started working on structural variation in the human genome as the human genome had come out. And then in the last seven years, I've been very much focused on the genetic causes of developmental disorders. Um, and so you, you'll have noticed that after about seven years of anything, I seem to get bored and move to something else. Uh, and I think that's a good thing about science that probably we don't often do enough of, which is, which is to follow our interests and to, to seek opportunities to evolve as scientists. Uh, and because I wasn't busy enough, I decided that I should co-found a, a startup company as well, which. Uh, uh, over the past five years. So I think it's okay to, to, to change what you do over time. Um, so these things might seem quite disparate, but, uh, but actually running through them is a very common thread, and that's, that's the understanding of mutation. And if we understand mutation, what we can do with that knowledge. Uh, so in the context of, of uh, Polynesian prehistory, if we understand mutation processes, we can start to date migration events uh, uh, across the Pacific. Uh, in the context of structural variation, uh, we'll hear a little bit about how, if we understand mutation processes, we can start to, to work out where we might un, uh, find copy number variation in the genome or where we might not find it. Uh, and of course, in developmental disorders, uh, we're all aware of the, the primacy of the role of de novo mutations. And I'll cover those latter two points most in this talk. So I'll, I'll start off talking on the causes of my title, which is about understanding the fundamental biology of mutation or different mutation processes, how we go about measuring those mutation processes, and then using those tools, how we understand the factors that influence the rates that mutations occur at. And then I'll go on to talk about the consequences, primarily in the context of developmental disorders. Uh, and then lastly, finish on some thoughts around the, the broader genetic architecture, thinking about other genetic models and uh, uh, and other, uh, other approaches. Uh, and, and throughout, I'll try and highlight the key members of my group and, and the broader uh, 
collaborative uh, group in, in which I work who have kind of done all the, all the main work. So to, so to start with, we, with mutation, it's important to think of us at the earliest stage of our life and the journey that our DNA takes as it goes from one generation to the next. So this is the zygote. And for the first 10 generations, everyone in this room had approximately the same journey. Um, the DNA, that is, on the way to the, towards the gamete. Uh, and that is the first 10 replications until we form the primordial germ cells, which get specified from which then the, the sperm and eggs develop. And this is where our, our, our paths diverge with uh, hopefully at least 50% of the room uh, then undergoing uh, another 20 replications of that DNA to form the immature oocytes that are present at birth, uh, which only then mature during the menstrual cycle. Whereas on the male side, uh, if we took a look at that cellular lineage, what happens is at puberty, we start to turn over spermatogonial stem cells so that sperm are produced throughout life. And they turn over 23 times a year. Uh, and that means that uh, if we take a roughly average uh, aged man, uh, father, and average aged mother at conception, the DNA that is in the sperm has typically been replicated 10 times more than the DNA in the egg. Uh, now, without knowing anything about uh, the, the, the process of mutation, if that replication process is in any way mutagenic, we might expect that the, there are more mutations in the next generation that come from the father than there are from the mother. We also might expect that the number of mutations increases uh, with age of the father. But bear in mind that only really uh, uh, may occur if those mutations really are, at least some of them, connected to the replication process. So when we're talking about mutation, we're really talking about a variety of different molecular processes, some of which we, we know and love. And so one way of representing them is by thinking about them in terms of the mutation rate on the, on the y-axis uh, and the size of the mutation. And so single base changes we know occur at a, at a given site in one in every 100 million to one in every 10 million generations, depending on the, the sequence context. Uh, if we look at slightly larger events, like uh, those that form uh, microsatellites or insertion deletions, then uh, they're very much more sequence context dependent. So microsatellites mutate much more rapidly, but the single copy sequence, they, they, they occur less frequently than single base changes. And then we have the, the very hyper-variable mini-satellites, which can have much higher mutation rates of the order of one in every 10 generations. And these were the ones that were first used for DNA fingerprinting in the uh, mid-1980s. Uh, and we also have processes such as retrotransposition, which generates, uh, for example, new alu and line elements, which over time have clearly come to occupy almost half of our genome, and some of which are still active. And then we have the kind of catch-all term of structural variation, which encompasses actually many different mutational processes, of which one uh, uh, I'll focus on is non-allelic homologous recombination, which will be familiar to many of you. But it generates a, a wide range in terms of size, and it, and it occupies a, a wide range in terms of rate as well. So to understand the causes, we need to try and measure those different mutation processes. And we have a number of different ways in which we can do that. And I've kind of represented the three of them that have been generally applied kind of in this kind of uh, schematic way here. And that's to compare the genomes of gametes to the, to the, to the donor of those gametes, uh, which is obviously most easier uh, in, in men. Uh, to do the, the obvious ex uh, simple experiment, which is to compare the genomes of children and their parents. Uh, which is something that's very easy to articulate, but was until the advent of next generation sequencing was very hard to do. Uh, and then also the evolutionary approaches. And I'll start off with this latter one to give you a sense of how uh, work by others, not by, by my group, has kind of used this to start to tease apart those kind of hypotheses that come out of just considering the cellular genealogy of the germline. So if we look at this uh, evolutionary approach first, uh, and we just simply think of base substitution events. So as shown uh, on, on the left-hand side here, uh, we can essentially, by comparing human and chimpanzee genomes, see that there's essentially three groups of chromosomes uh, on the basis of their sequence divergence. You've got the X chromosome at the top. Uh, you've got the Y chromosome at the bottom. Um, and I have a box saying that Microsoft PowerPoint has stopped working. So let's see. I'm pretty sure that wasn't me. But I can see why it crashed. <laughs> 
Right. Thank you for your patience. So hopefully this next click of the, uh, of the cursor is going to go well, because this is where it went wrong last time. Excellent. So what we can see is there's essentially three groups of chromosomes. There's the X chromosome, which has a, a divergence of about one in every 100 bases between humans and chimpanzees. You've got all of the autosomes, which are uh, about one in every 75 bases. And you've got the Y chromosome, which is one in every 50 bases. Uh, and so, and, and so it's clear that mutations have been accumulating at different rates on these chromosomes. And if we think a little bit about how these chromosomes are passed from one generation to the next, we can understand this. Because the X chromosome spends two thirds of its time being transmitted from a mother, uh, whereas the Y chromosome spends all of its time being transmitted from a father. So if the, the male line is more mutagenic, as we hypothesized earlier, that's entirely consistent with what we see of this different level of divergence of the different chromosomes. So that's one, uh, one uh, piece of evidence from the evolutionary perspective that, that the male sign is more mutagenic. And now I'm going to talk about a different mutation process and talk about uh, looking at gametes. And this is actually one of the key experiments that I, I went to the Sanger to do in 2003, which uh, took us about five years to get to work properly. And that's what I call the, the sperm in a haystack problem. So, so this is essentially about trying to identify very rare sperm in amongst a pool of other sperm that carry a particular mutation. And that mutation is a deletion or a duplication event that has a consistent breakpoint. And so one can use PCR across that breakpoint to try and identify whether a pool of sperm does or doesn't contain a, a one or more sperm that contain that breakpoint. And, and over a series of, uh, of, of uh, several years, Dan Turner, who, who did this work, uh, managed to develop uh, eight different assays for four different regions of the genome, uh, all of which cause uh, clinically relevant uh, disorders, uh, whether it be Charcot-Marie tooth type 1A rearrangements on chromosome 17 or infertility-inducing rearrangements on the Y chromosome, such as uh, the AZFA HERV uh, loci. Uh, and what Dan showed is there's substantially different mutation rates for each of, these, uh, each of these different rearrangements. So you tend to see the deletion occurs more frequently than the duplication. Um, and you see that the, uh, there are some events that are much more, more frequent. So deletion at the, uh, the Charcot-Marie tooth locus uh, occurs in about one in every 25,000 sperm, whereas the duplication at the LCR17P locus occurs in about one in a million sperm. Uh, but what, of course, that means is these, this is sperm from, from quite normal male donors, is that in the testes of every man in this room uh, are sperm, hundreds or thousands of sperm that contain all of these rearrangements. And when we conceive children, we all spin the roulette wheel uh, as to whether one of those sperm is going to end up fertilizing the egg. So this not only uh, as, uh, was a uh, a kind of an investigation into the fundamental mutation process. It also gave us clues into particular genomic disorders which were being underdiagnosed because we would estimate the population prevalence based of the sperm data would be substantially higher than has, was up to that point in 2008 had been found. And that largely turned out to be true with the uh, adoption of, of more broad microarray testing that showed that some of these rearrangements for example, the reciprocal duplication of the Williams-Buren syndrome locus uh, are actually much more uh, common than we had previously thought, uh, especially in clinical samples. And so but one now has a, a, a molecular trait that one can measure and start to do kind of classical genetics on. So we tried to do this by collecting sperm from twins to understand whether the mutation rate was likely to be modified by genetic background. And so we took the most mutable locus, so this deletion, uh, and we assayed sperm from twins. And what we observed was that for these rearrangements, then the, the mutation rate you'll see, or see in twin A was, uh, was highly correlated with the mutation rate you'd see in their twin. Now, this would be deeply uninteresting if uh, it was simply a effect of different ages, because it's very hard to get sperm from, from twins, uh, as it turns out. And it's, it's, very, it's impossible to get sperm from twins who are all the same age. Uh, so this could just be a, a, an age effect. But when, but when we looked at age with a bigger panel of sperm donors, we see absolutely no relationship with father's age with the, the mutation rate of these particular rearrangement, this particular rearrangement. And this is work done by Jackie, Jackie MacArthur. So, so, and I'll come back to that in a moment as to why that might be. But I want to move on to what I'll, I'll talk about for most of the rest of the talk, which is about measuring mutation rates using next generation sequencing. And this is the real, this is uh, conceptually incredibly simple. We want to look, uh, and I'll focus mostly on single base changes, 
uh, we want to look at a child's genome, compare it to the parental genome, and identify the differences. Uh, and when the next generation sequences came on, that became possible. And the first time we did this was in the context of the Thousand Genomes Project, and Don Conrad led that work. So you essentially, you identify new mutations, you convince yourself that they're real and not the artifacts by doing extensive validation, and then you work out which ones come from mum and which ones come from dad, and, and in those early experiments, it did seem true that most of them come from dad, as has been borne out. Uh, and perhaps one of the, the, the nicest piece of work on this was done by Decode uh, six years ago now by looking at the relationship uh, between the number of mutations on the y-axis in a child and the age of the father on the x-axis, showing a, a roughly linear accumulation. And all of us in, the, in this room have somewhere between 40 and 100 de novo mutations that our, our parents don't have. Uh, and uh, through looking at the slope of this line, uh, they estimated and, and, and uh, other people have corroborated that between two and three mutations accumulate per additional year of a man's life. And of course, most of those mutations that you see in the child are of parental, uh, paternal origin. And we did a similar kind of experiment, but rather than focusing on uh, lots of unrelated trios by looking at families that had multiple siblings over a long period of time. Uh, and so we could start to uh, plot this for individual families, which therefore controlling uh, for genetic background and to some degree uh, environmental exposures. And there's some interesting uh, potential signals here of differences between families of, of how mutations accumulate over time that deserve further uh, investigation. So why do we have these two different mutational processes, the one creating single base changes and the other these large rearrangements that I described, uh, where one has a clear relationship with paternal age and one doesn't? So this goes back to this genealogy uh, that I showed you of, the, of how the DNA gets from the zygote to the gamete. And the single base changes uh, that you can see can occur at any one of these uh, stages of this genealogy. Whereas what I didn't tell you was the, all of the rearrangements that, uh, that I mentioned are all formed by non-allelic homologous recombination. And this is, uh, it happens only during meiosis. Uh, and therefore, irrespective of the number of replications up to meiosis, there's only one single cell division per sperm or per egg where these rearrangements can occur. And that, we think, likely explains why we see no relationship with parental age uh, with this particular class of mutation. So again, understanding this genealogy, understanding the molecular process, allows us to understand those observations about the relationship with parental age. Uh, and we've got some unpublished work where, of course, we can apply exactly the same paradigm to other species and, think, and give us some insights into how the germline mutation rate might have evolved over time. Uh, and we've done some work with some mouse pedigrees that's very analogous to what I've just described in humans. And, and I've listed here some of the key differences. So the, so the first is that mice have fewer mutations. They have uh, only about 20 mutations per genome compared to about 70 on average in humans. Uh, and uh, that perhaps uh, uh, corroborates a hypothesis that uh, Michael Lynch has, has uh, proposed that species that have larger effective population sizes are able to select down their germline mutation rate lower than species that have smaller effective population sizes. And of course, mice have much bigger effective population sizes than humans. But really, we need many more species uh, to anal analyze in similar ways to be able to, to kind of conclude that robustly. The other thing that we found that was interesting is when you detect de novo mutations in humans, about 4% of them uh, are obviously post-zygotic. In other words, they occur in the first or second uh, cell division of the offspring, whereas that's actually a much higher proportion in mice. Uh, now, obviously, the average generation time of mice is much shorter than humans. It's more like nine months rather than 30 years. Uh, and there's fewer replications on average overall. And so a higher proportion of the mutations occurring earlier is perhaps not that surprising. But it was uh, certainly interesting to us to see that. Uh, also, the paternal-maternal ratio is not as strikingly different between uh, mouse and humans. Now, one of the key differences in that genealogy that I showed you is that a much lower fraction of the overall cell replications in mice come from those spermatogonial stem cell divisions because there's a much smaller lag between puberty and, and having offspring. Uh, and one thing that we, we uh, could infer from that slope over time of the age effect in mice compared to humans is the mutation rate per cell division in those spermatogonial stem cells is about three times lower in humans than it is in mice. So, so given that I'm going to spend the rest of the talk talking about the pathological consequences of de novo mutations, we should be very thankful we're not mice, otherwise they would be potentially three times worse than they are. <laughs> 
And that sort of suggests to us that species like humans that have evolved to have a much uh, longer generation time with more spermatogonial stem cell have probably selected down the mutation rate specifically in those cell divisions to accommodate those, those longer generation times. But again, that's a hypothesis that we need to, we need to flesh out uh, with more evidence. And this was work done led by Sarah Lindsay and, and Joanna Kaplanis. And you can see it on BioArchive, and hopefully it'll come out soon. So I'm going to spend the rest of the talk talking about consequences. Uh, and I'm going to focus mainly on the development, Deciphering Developmental Disorders Study, or DDD study, that uh, Joris mentioned, uh, which I co-lead with Helen and, and, and other colleagues, Helen Firth. And the work I'm going to describe, first of all, is the consequences of new mutations that hit coding sequences. And this is work that was done and, uh, by, largely by Jeremy McRae, uh, uh, supported by a number of bioinformaticians. Um, and so the Deciphering Developmental Disorders Project, for those of you who, who, who aren't so familiar with it, is really a collaboration across the UK and Ireland with, with all the clinical genetic centers recruiting patients into the study with the aim of using new genomic technologies uh, microarrays and exome sequencing, uh, and now increasingly genome sequencing, to try and both understand the genetic basis of these disorders, but also to catalyze uh, more rapid, uh, more accurate diagnosis. And so over the course of four years, we recruited over 13,000 families uh, through 200 different clinical colleagues throughout the UK and Ireland. And uh, we've exome sequenced and array CGH those families, and I'm going to talk primarily about the exome sequencing data uh, and of, of those 13,000 families, we have about 10,000 where we have DNA from mum and dad, and we can do trios analysis. And currently, we're able to diagnose about 35 to 40%, and hopefully some of you would have heard Caroline Wright talk about how that's uh, crept up over time as we've understood more about the genetic architecture of disorders. But going into this, thinking about the genetic architecture, there's a number of different possible explanatory factors here ranging from coding mutations, be they recessive and dominant, mutations near coding regions that affect splicing, mutations potentially further away that affect gene regulation, to other more complicated non-monogenic models like oligogenic or polygenic or gene by environment interactions, or of course possible environmental exposures that we don't yet currently understand. So, so going in, we'd really like to try and understand this complete architecture. Now, it may be that we might see something that looks like this, where it's very dominated by uh, the monogenic perspective, be it dominant and recessive, and that's certainly, I think, the, the expectation from much of the clinical community coming in. But it may be we find, actually, an increasing amount of these more complicated uh, models, these polygenic and oligogenic models, uh, and that's something I'll touch on at the end. So in terms of thinking about the genetic architecture, perhaps the first place to look is those where we are clearly very confident about the cause, sufficiently confident to return a diagnosis to the families. And if we look at those diagnoses, and here I'm showing on the right-hand side the top 20 diagnoses that are made uh, in, the, in the cohort, uh, and all of these are dominant disorders. Uh, so no recessive disorder makes it into the, into the top 20. Uh, and uh, if you break down to the types of mutations, all but two of those uh, have a, a substantial fraction of truncating mutations. So we think these are likely to be loss of function, and there are a couple uh, uh, of genes in there where it looks more likely to be uh, uh, altered function, gain of function, or dominant negative mechanisms. So overall, de novo mutations are uh, more prevalent among those diagnoses, so that suggests we might have more power to detect new dominant disorders than we might to, uh, to detect new recessive disorders. So the other thing we can do is we can start to interrogate the mutation processes and the factors that are influencing the number of mutations we see in these families, not just looking at the diagnostic variants, but looking at all of the de novo mutations we see. Uh, and when we do this, we see clear evidence of that paternal age effect that we mentioned, but also us and others have identified a, a more subtle maternal age effect, which is shown on the right-hand side here. Um, and that kind of increase of two to three de novo mutations per genome per year that was seen with father's age actually can be broken down into some of that that comes from the father and some that comes from the mother um, because, of course, mother's and father's age are quite tightly correlated. And an understanding of the mutation process allows us to ask a very simple question is, for each gene in turn throughout the genome, does it have more de novo damaging mutations than we would expect to see by chance given what we understand about the mutation process and the number of trios that we've sequenced? And when one does this with about 4,000 trios, that, uh, as Jeremy did, one finds there's about uh, just under 100, so 94 different genes that are significantly, genome-wide, significantly enriched at a pretty stringent threshold shown by the, the red dashed line near the bottom there. 
Uh, and this kind of Manhattan plot perspective, uh, typically seen in GWAS, uh, works quite nicely for showing these data genome-wide. And we've also been trying to leverage some of the deeper phenotypic data uh, to try and uh, characterize the phenot phenotype of these, of these disorders. And, and I'm, uh, by, by working closely with, with the consultant clinical geneticists and also with experts in image analysis, and Chris Nelliker, I think, is, uh, is at the meeting. Uh, and Chris uh, and his group have been able to distill out of the patients who have the same underlying uh, disorder these average faces, which we hope will inform diagnosticians about, uh, about interpreting variants and, and th considering genetic testing, the average faces for different disorders. So amongst those 94 genes were about uh, 14 or so which hadn't been robustly associated with developmental disorders previously. Uh, and we can use the pattern of mutations in these genes to say something about the likely un the underlying mechanism. Uh, and so each of these kind of proteins are shown primary sequence here of these 14 different uh, disorders. Uh, and above them, which I don't expect you to read, are red lines showing the positions of the mutations. But hopefully you can appreciate that four of these have extremely clustered mutations throughout the sequence. Uh, which we think are likely operating by uh, gain-of-function mechanisms, whereas 10 of them have mutations spread throughout and include truncating mutations. So, m truncating mutations. so we think these are haploinsufficient disorders. So th then there's the question of what do we not, what do we do we not have power to see? What other uh, de novo disorders might be left to discover? And we can do this by, again, rather than asking the question of a single gene, does it have more mutations than we would expect to see by chance? We can ask the question of all the genes in the exome, all 20,000 or so, are, how many more mutations that it seem to be damaging would, are we seeing more than we would anticipate under a, a normal mutational model? And the answer is in about those 4,000 trios, we see about an extra 1,200 missense mutations and an extra 600 or so truncating mutations. Uh, and that leads us to, to, to uh, hypothesize that somewhere between 40 and 50% of the cohort probably has an underlying de novo coding mutation at the root of their disorder, of which only about two-thirds are fall in the genes that we already know about. And I think we can also use this ratio of excess truncating mutations to excess missense mutations to say something about the relative contribution overall of loss of function versus gain of function mechanisms. Because we know that if we look at haploinsufficient genes, uh, that uh, there's a roughly one-to-one -one ratio of missense mutations and, and, uh, and loss of function mutations. And so we can apportion these missense mutations, ex the excess that we see, between those that are likely operating by a loss of function mechanism and those that are likely operating by gain of function mechanism. So we think across these 40 or 50 percent of children whose disorders are caused by de novo mutations, that about 60 percent are loss of function and 40 percent uh, uh, altered function. So this is the kind of situation that we think we're in at the moment. About a quarter of the patients have a mut de novo mutation in a gene that we've robustly associated with disease. And, uh, and then the, the remainder of that uh, 40 to 50 percent probably splits about half and half between loss of function disorders and gain of function disorders. Uh, and we would anticipate that those gain of function disorders probably have smaller mutational targets and are going to take us longer to find. And so there's a real need to bring together data sets uh, across the world to try and identify these new disorders that are probably going to be rarer and rarer. And so one thing we can also do with the mutation process is try to ask not just questions of the cohort that we've recruited, but also of the population at large. And we can estimate what's the rate of having a child with a developmental disorder caused by a de novo mutation in coding sequence. And we estimate that's about one in 300 births. And we can even, given that we know what the, uh, the increase in mutations with father's age and mother's age, is we can provide a, an age-related risk of this. So it varies between, if mother and father are young, on the top left-hand side, it varies between about one in 400 risk to about a one in 200 risk if, uh, if mother and father are both in their early 40s. And so this is actually a pretty substantive healthcare burden across the world, if one thinks about it, because this equates to about 400,000 babies being born a year with one of these disorders. Um, so it's a, it's a pretty, it, this is a, a, a very democratic disease mechanism. It affects all populations across the world. So I've described up to now work on developmental disorders that we see postnatally typically recruited through clinical genetics departments. 
But we also see pick up these uh, developmental disorders earlier, prenatally, and, and working within a, a different study, the PAGE study, the, uh, the prenatal assessment of genomes and exomes, we've been investigating this in, uh, in some detail. And we've, uh, we've now exome sequenced over 600 parent fetus trios. Uh, and we find with a, a, a structural abnormality picked up on ultrasound, and we find a much lower diagnostic yield, more like 9%. Uh, and that's in part because there's actually a, a much greater heterogeneity amongst those different ultrasound indications as to whether they're likely to have an a, a underlying mutation or uh, underlying uh, monogenic cause. Now, not all of these are de novo mutations, but like uh, the postnatal situation, the majority are de novo mutations. And the highest risk, uh, the highest likelihood of having a diagnosis occurs in this multi-system uh, group of disorders uh, down at the bottom, which is uh, among the most common amongst the recruitment. And it's much lower if there's just an isolated nuchal translucency, which again mirrors the work that we see uh, that has been done previously with using array-based technologies. We can also think about a slightly different context of using this prenatally, which is in the context of a fetal demise and subsequent to a post-mortem, uh, which has a much more detailed phenotypic information and potentially a, a greater ability to identify cases that might benefit from genetic testing. Uh, now, this is a much smaller cohort now, but with 27 trios, uh, we've been able to show a much higher diagnostic yield, more like uh, equivalent to what we see in the postnatal situation of more like 30 to 40 percent. Uh, and, and again, here, de novo mutations uh, predominate amongst these. So, so this gives us some sense that actually we can, we can diagnose these disorders, but the more phenotypic information we have, the, the better we're going to be able to identify which families are, are likely to benefit. Uh, and we have some evidence from this that there's going to be heterogeneity among, uh, with perhaps the highest rates being in multi-system disorders and lower rates being single organ malformations. And that chimes quite well with some work done uh, by uh, Alejandro Sifrim and Mark Hitz in my group a couple of years ago on congenital heart defects. And what they did was to contra contrast using trios again and exome sequencing the genetic architectures of syndromic congenital heart defects, which uh, typically have neurodevelopmental problems as well as a heart defect, with isolated heart defects where there's no obvious other uh, develop developmental problems. And when they looked at de novo mutations in genes that we know to be dominantly associated with congenital heart defects, they found a much more significant enrichment, um, hopefully you can see here, uh, with the syndromic congenital heart defects for de novo mutations than with the non-syndromic isolated heart defects. But conversely, when they started looking not at de novo mutations, but at inherited mutations, uh, even inherited truncating mutations, but in genes that we know are to be robustly associated with congenital heart defects, that we see the opposite. We see in the non-syndromic group here, we see a significant enrichment of these transmitted from parents who appear to have no heart defects themselves, an excess of transmitted truncating variants in known congenital heart disease-associated genes. And if we look at the genes that have de novo mutations in versus transmitted truncating mutations, they're actually completely distinct from, the, from one another. So the set of genes on the, in orange on the left that have de novo mutations in syndromic CHD is completely distinct from the set of genes on the right that have inherited truncating mutations in non-syndromic CHD. And this is starting to point towards something that I think we're going to have to, have to grapple with over the next few years, and that's interpreting inherited damaging variants that aren't working by a recessive mechanism, but are going to lead us down a path of thinking more about incomplete penetrance, even within pediatric disorders, um, as well as potentially gene by environmental interactions. So we're still left with uh, half of the cohort uh, having not got a de novo mutation encoding sequence. And so the natural question to ask is, how important is non-coding sequence? And this is work done by Patrick Short in my group. And so what we did here was we actually seeded the exome sequencing that we uh, used in the DDD project with probes to sequences in the non-coding parts of the genome that seemed more likely to have a regulatory function and potentially more relevant for developmental disorders. This is back in, in 2010, which really was the dark ages in terms of annotating the functional uh, basis of non-coding sequence. And so we started with experimentally validated enhancers from uh, the VISTA group. Uh, we took the top 4,000 ultra-conserved elements, about which we heard uh, uh, much over the past couple of days, uh, as well as some heart enhancers. 
And we also get some free intronic sequence with the, uh, with the exome sequencing anyway. And so what we wanted to do is ask the question, are any of these classes of regulatory sequence uh, enriched for de novo mutations in the same way that we see for genes? And so when we did that, we found that uh, firstly, our de novo mutation models are really good because uh, in the vast, in the both three sets, the intronic probes, the heart enhancers, and the experimentally validated enhancers from VISTA, we see essentially exactly the same number of mutations we'd expect to see under a null mutation model, so no enrichment. And only in those ultra-conserved elements do we see a subtle enrichment. But now we can layer on top the functional genomic annotation that's arisen since, this, uh, since the exome sequencing was designed. Now, 80 to 90% of the children in the cohort have neurodevelopmental disorders, so the regulatory sequences we care most about are those that are active in fetal brain. And if we then split those ultra-conserved elements between those that are active in fetal brain versus those that aren't active, we see all of that enrichment occurs just in the set that are active in fetal brain. And then if we stratify the cohort into those that have a neurodevelopmental problem and those that do not, then we see that all of that enrichment in those fetal brain active enhancers falls within the, the set of the cohort, the majority of the cohort, that has a neurodevelopmental disorder. So this suggests to us a specific, uh, specific in terms of tissue of activity and specific in terms of phenotype of patient enrichment of de novo mutations. But the question then is, how much does this account for? We've only sequenced of the patients. We've only sequenced a very small fraction of the fetal brain active elements. There's about 100 megabases of regulatory sequence that's active in fetal brain. Now, if we look at that 100 megabases sequence that's active in fetal brain, what we see is the vast majority of it, this is shown by the histogram at the bottom, the vast majority is not well conserved. So we see the majority of it is, is lowly conserved, and only a small minority is highly conserved. And if we look at how the de novo mutation enrichment that we saw tracks with the level of conservation, we can see that it's only enriched where the conservation is high. And so although we've only sequenced uh, a few megabases of this sequence, we've sequenced half of this ultra-conserved portion of fetal brain active elements. And that suggests that extrapolating out to the rest of the genome, this will possibly explain 1% to 3% uh, as a lower and upper bound in terms of the mutations. Now, of course, there may be other classes of, of non-coding cause. There may be recessive causes. There may be other classes of, of uh, mutations, such as indels uh, or structural variants that we don't have the ability to discern currently. But uh, it does suggest that at least de novo mutations in coding sequences explain 40 to 50 percent, whereas de novo sequences in ultra-conserved elements probably only explain 1 to 3 percent. So then the question is, can we identify any new disorders by using that same approach of identifying individual regulatory elements that have too many de novo mutations? And unfortunately, the answer is no. So, so this is the Manhattan plot of looking at genes if you, uh, if you apply exactly this analysis on 8,000 trios. And this is the, uh, I hesitate to call it Manhattan plot, this is the Cambridge stroke Netherlands plot. Um, where it's essentially flat. So we don't see any regulatory elements above this significance threshold. So we can't necessarily define any specific disorders through this, uh, at least not yet. And we think there are three reasons why. The first is that unlike the coding regions, we're not able to discern the damaging mutations from the benign mutations. So we have to lump them all together. Secondly, the, uh, the regulatory elements themselves are of the order of a few hundred bases. They're significantly shorter than genes, so they're a smaller mutational target, and that means we have lower statistical power. But thirdly, and we think critically, we think the proportion of mutations in these elements that can be pathogenic is much, much lower than certainly for haploinsufficient genes, where maybe up to 10% of mutations might have a, a loss of function impact. We think it's much more likely to be of the order of 2% of or even 1% of mutations in these ultra-conserved elements. So it's certainly not going to be the primary reason why these are ultra-conserved. So it's going to be challenging, and a few, few hundred whole genome trios is not going to really resolve this. We're going to have to collectively put together tens of thousands of whole genome sequence trios to really understand the non-coding regions. So I want to just end with some thoughts about the genetic architecture of developmental disorders and highlight two pieces of work that should be coming out shortly. The first is taking a population genetic approach to thinking about what's the burden of recessive disease in the DDD cohort. So we can look throughout population resources such as EXAC and NOMAD or our own data on unaffected parents and look at the frequency of damaging variants, inherited variants in the, in the population and ask how likely it is that we see two damaging vari variants uh, on the two alleles in an individual. 
and can we see an enrichment of damaging variants, biallelic damaging variants, uh, within our cohort that indicates roughly what the contribution of recessive disease might be. And Hilary Martin, who's here, who drove this work, found that when she did this, that this, the recessive burden in the portion of the cohort, the majority of the cohort with European, uh, Northwest European ancestry, uh, that is more like 4%, the recessive burden, compared to the more like 40 to 50% for de novo mutations in coding sequence. Whereas if we move to the, the, the British uh, individuals with Pakistani origin, it's much more like 30%. Uh, and this is uh, not really a feature of being Pakistani or European, but of, of consanguinity, because if one looks at the uh, non-consanguinous portion of the British Pakistani, one sees a very similar burden to that that we observe in the British outbred population. So this is clearly an impact of consanguinity, whereby uh, there's still de novo mutations in those consanguinous families, but actually the role of recessive mutations is at least as large as that. So uh, bear in mind that everything I talked about about the burden is going to depend on the population that one's studying and, uh, and remembering that 10% of the world uh, practices consanguineous marriage. So that, that kind of gives us a sense that, you know, if we look in the coding space under a dominant or recessive or indeed an X-linked model, which I don't have time to describe, we can explain that maybe about 50 to 60% of the cohort, but we have still half the cohort to explain with potentially more complicated mechanisms. And one thing we've been exploring more recently, and this is work by uh, both Mary Niemi and, and Hilary Martin, is to apply the kind of GWAS uh, thinking uh, and methodologies to the, to the DDD cohort by doing a case control study. And what that shows is there's actually significant polygenic heritability uh, within a cohort, even with such as severe disorders as, as uh, DDD. Now that we don't see any genome-wide significant SNPs and we wouldn't expect to see given the heterogeneity of the cohort. Uh, but we can validate this, this polygenic risk in these common variants by showing it's over-transmitted in a separate set of trios. The other thing we can do is we can start to see whether this polygenic risk of being within the DDD cohort correlates with other traits that are being studied uh, using this kind of GWAS uh, approach. And what we can clearly see is that in the, in the top, uh, we have the traits that are most closely correlated with the risk of being in the DDD cohort, and they are educational attainment and the, the, the composite scores for cognitive performance uh, no, uh, with intelligence, with neg being negatively correlated with both of those and positively correlated with the risk of having schizophrenia. So that's a, 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 a su suggesting there's a genetic architecture broadly across the neurodevelopmental space that's in common uh, within the polygenic uh, component of these disorders. The other things we can see, perhaps surprisingly, is this polygenic risk isn't just concentrated in those that don't have a monogenic cause, um, but is also present in those that have a, a, well, a clear monogenic cause, suggesting that there's the polygenic component is not just explaining the undiagnosed fraction of the cohort, but is influencing the penetrance or perhaps expressivity of, of the, those with a, a large single uh, effect variant uh, in coding regions. And on the next slide, I'll show you the work that Mari's done to, to show that the, the polygenic component is probably influencing expression of these disorders. So what Mari did was take traits that we measured in the DDD cohort shown on the left-hand side and compare them to the polygenic signals from population studies uh, next to them. So for the birth weight of these children compared to the, the studies that have been done on GWAS of birth weight, height, head circumference, autistic behavior, whether a clinician has annotated autistic behavior, uh, and the GWAS studies on autism. Uh, and for all of those, we can see a very significant correlation between those. Essentially, if your polygenic risk of, uh, of autism is higher, you're more likely to, do, to, even if you have a very strong effect in over mutation in the coding region, you're more likely to express autistic features in your behavior. There's also some suggestion, uh, uh, as uh, people have mooted for a long time, that the polygenic risk of, uh, of low educational attainment is stronger in the mild end of intellectual disability than in the severe end of intellectual disability, uh, with the, the, the hypothesis for many years being that, that that less severe end of intellectual disability has a bigger contribution from polygenicity. So I think this starts to, start to make us think about at least three classes of genetic variation interacting. The very common variants, the polygenic risk, the uh, very monogenic sufficient variants, such as de novo mutations, and the intermediate, the kind of rare inherited damaging variants. And I think the next five years will be very productive in thinking about how these interact with one another. <laughs>
So one of the things that's been a great pleasure through working with the DDD has been the way it's brought people together. And there's over 100 papers to, uh, now, including DDD authors on. Uh, and these maps show the intensity of collaboration, both within the UK, but also especially within Europe and, and, uh, and beyond. Uh, and that kind of fits within the context, as, as Joris mentioned, about the importance of data sharing uh, and the work that, that uh, Helen Firth initiated back in 2004 on the, on the Decipher initiative, which many in this room will both be aware of and be users of and depositors to, uh, that has fostered, again, a, a global network of collaboration, uh, but again, centered with a huge amount of European activity. Uh, and being connected to the EBI and ensemble resources has been able to allow us to integrate information on protein structures and genomic annotation as and when it becomes available. Uh, and by integrating the DDD data into that resource, we've been able to provide richer genotypic and phenotypic summaries, including those facial images that I mentioned before. And so that, that collaboration has been really a, 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 a rewarding and in, a very enriching part of this work. And, and thank you to all of you that have participated in both the uh, uh, DDD-related publications and also the Decipher uh, initiative. So with that, uh, I'm very honored uh, again to, to be able to talk to you today. And, but I really need to thank the members of my group, who I, I, uh, many of whom I've listed uh, throughout, and apologies to those that I, that I haven't, the many collaborators who've worked with us on these projects, uh, and especially the, the kind of team of, of uh, often hundreds of individuals that have come together across the UK to work on the, the DDD and, and Decipher initiatives. And, uh, and unusually, I'd like to take the opportunity to, to just highlight five people who have been particularly formative for me throughout my career. And, and we have this opportunity of working amongst a rich set of colleagues, of uh, both collaborating with them, but crucially learning from them, both learning about how to do our science, but also learning about how to integrate our science with our lives. Uh, and, and key individuals for me have been uh, Mark Jobling, my PhD supervisor, uh, Nigel Carter, uh, my, my uh, initial mentor at Sanger, and Jim Lupsky, uh, uh, who many of you will know uh, from Baylor, uh, Helen Firth, my long-term conspirator on, on all things developmental, uh, and Jeff Barrett, who uh, uh, has uh, recently left the Sanger faculty, but it's been an absolute critical part of much of the research that I've uh, described to you. Uh, and with that, I'll be, uh, I'm honored and thank you uh, and happy to take questions after if we don't have enough time. <laughs>